Kirsch Strait was not wide. Less than five versts across its narrowest, to use the local measurement. That was a huge gap compared with the Bosphorus, but narrow enough to see the coast on either side from the deck of Uzbanaria. The hills sloped steeply upwards on the Crimean shore, the buildings of the town of Kerch itself clinging to them. Ahead lay the Sea of Azov. This is still the familiar route of 13 years before, but it would be over much sooner, perhaps in less than a day, according to the captain. Already they were sailing against the outflow from the River Don at the other end of the small, isolated stretch of water. But on this occasion, he would not be making the tiresome journey of the river into the heart of Russia. On his next visit, he would make that journey and be hailed as a king. For now, this outpost of the great empire would suffice. Once they had dropped anchor, then all he needed to do was wait. Others would do his work for him. In the autumn of 1825, Tsar Alexander I and his Tsaritsa travelled south. They wintered beside the Sea of Azov, a branch of the Black Sea that marks the eastern edge of the Crimean Peninsula. In the winter, the sea regularly freezes over, but it was still warmer than the capital, St. Petersburg. Ostensibly, the trip was for the sake of the Tsaritsa's health, but it was to be Alexander who did not return alive. Even as he breathed his last, a single yacht stood on the horizon, watching and waiting. More than a century later, rumours spread across Russia as to what had truly happened to the great Tsar, the man who had defeated Napoleon. Within the royal household itself, gossip was as widespread as anywhere. Even Tolstoy, author of War and Peace, wrote his own version of what had become of Alexander. Thirteen years later tells the story of a race across Russia by a veteran of Napoleonic Wars, desperate to save the Tsar from the fate that neither will fully understand. Alexei Ivanovich Danilov is now a colonel, still a spy, still a man for whom love of his country can be surpassed only by love of humanity. He never dreamed that the monsters who fought in 1812 could have some connection to the Russian throne. He never guessed that the word Vordlak might mean as much to his Tsar as it did to him. Nor did he ever suspect what he would encounter deep beneath the Crimean mountains. In the novel 12, the first part of the Danilov Quintet, Alexei fought against monsters he believed to be myths. Thirteen years later, he knows better, but he also comes to realise that this knowledge must soon be passed to a new generation. The Russian Revolution is still almost a hundred years away, but even in 1825, in St. Petersburg, revolution is in the air. On news of the death of Alexander, thousands of troops took to the streets, hoping to force a constitution. They failed. Had they succeeded, the history of Russia, of the whole world, might have been very different. As it was, 1825 saw the succession of perhaps the most authoritarian Tsar of the 19th century, Nikolai I. The Danilov Quintet goes on to see his death, a relatively peaceful one, and those of his son and great-grandson, both murdered for the name that they bore and for the power that went with it. Almost none of the characters we know from the book so far will live to see those final events, but the name of Danilov still has a crucial role to play.